I am Duff Gold, a geologist born in a very rural area of South Africa. Little did I realize the influence that an article in the National Geographic magazine would play on my interests for the rest of my life. While I was in high school, I read an article in the National Geographic magazine that dealt with a crater that had been recently found in northern Quebec. Little did I realize at the time that this particular crater would be one that I'd be visiting 12 years later and actually doing a fair amount of work around. My interest <coughs> while at graduate school, I'd been working on volcanic processes that produce craters and Mars, was to uh, work with Dominion Observatory during the summer to determine whether the craters were formed from endogenic within the Earth or exogenic from outside the Earth processes. And here I'd like to acknowledge the role that Frank DeKille, a professor at Penn State, had on me at the time I arrived at Penn State in 1964. Frank was a very forward-looking scientist. He built his own telescope. One evening while examining the moon, we saw a, trans a very rare transient lunar phenomena. Frank also was building an aeroplane in his basement and always kidded him about how he's going to get it out without having to demolish his house. He had an article in 1962 that inspired me greatly. I've reproduced part of this article in this series of slides. One on the left shows a table in which he's trying to calibrate natural phenomena with earth or man-made events to get an idea of what the scale of energy was involved. On the right hand side, Frank pointed out that if you superimpose the size of Meteor Crater, Arizona, bottom right, onto New York, it literally demolished the whole city. At that stage, you realized what the effects on mankind could be in terms of one of these strange, uh, random types of events that might take place in nature. My research while at McGill was on deep-seated volcanic processes that might form gas-driven types of craters at the surface. And at the same time, I spent time with the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa working on craters that might be of exogenic origin. It was a fortuitous time to be there. And at this particular time, Frank had convinced me to consider meteorites as a means of delivering ultra-high energy events. The following cartoon is here to illustrate some terminology and the effects of our atmosphere in shielding us from these visitors from space. Most of the larger objects will end up breaking up in the atmosphere and then deaccelerating from speeds of many tens of kilometers a second down to normal gravitational falls uh, closer to the Earth. A very large object is likely to barrel its way right through, blast its way right through the atmosphere and land on the ground. It's for us to try and find out what the effects of these that actually land may look like. Before we pass from this, we should notice two terminologies here, the near Earth orbiting <coughs> asteroids or meteorites, and these are defined as being within 1.3 astronomical <coughs> units and that is 93 million miles from the Earth, and in other words, something like 140 million miles from the Earth. Too far for us to really be concerned about possible impacts. Ones we nearly need to be concerned about are the potentially hazardous objects. These are large asteroids of comet orbiting within 0.05 astronomical units of the Earth, or 7.5 million kilometers. The rest of my talk is going to be largely geared around those that actually make it to the Earth's surface and the effects it might have in impacting onto the Earth's surface. Most people are familiar with comets because of the very flashy corona that these things display. And uh, what I'd like to do is emphasize a little bit more about what some of these fiery sort of object from space might mean to us. Halley's Comet is one of the most familiar of these types of events. It recurs about every 70 years. The left-hand side just shows the orbit of Halley's Comet coming through to close to the Earth environment. 
Very little in the way of the history of these has been recorded, except for some bizarre sorts of events, such as this one in a <coughs> tapestry at the uh, Bayeux uh, Observatory. Notice the comet in the middle of the top there. And these always had some sort of omen associated with them, either good or evil in intent. A lot more common are the fireballs that come through the sky from time to time. And for me, one of the highlights of my life was to watch the impact on <coughs> July the 16th, 1944, of the fragments of the Shima Levy comet impacting onto Jupiter. Uh, it's a truly amazing thing and for me, a very important part of my life. The following diagram show the impact one of essentially 26 portions of the shoemaker levy coming in and ultimately striking onto uh, Jupiter. And take a look at the dot on the left, that is the potential impact site. Fireballs are far more common, and these are some that have occurred within sort of living memory. I was fortunate enough to be involved in one of these at like Revelstoke, which is a relatively small one that had crossed over central Canada and heading towards British Columbia. We tried tracking this thing. Fortunately, there had been a fresh fall of snow, and so we were able to narrow down where the impact site was likely to be. Newscasts were set out, and some hunters in the Revelstoke area in British Columbia, noticed a lot of black material, which they thought was tar, on a lake. Collected a pile of it onto the lake surface, and were going to bring some of it out with them when they came out from their hunt. When they came back a few days later, of course, the black body on the ice had all melted through. And they brought back about a matchbox full of material. This was sent on to labs in British Columbia, and somebody thought this was a hell of a hoax, and threw it out. And at lunch that day, he mentioned it, and they said, no, no, it could be a carbonaceous chondrite, one of the rare forms of uh, asteroids that come through. And in turn, it turned out to be, but all they recovered are a couple of cc's. The one that is well <clears throat> represented in the literature is one I call in Tunguska. And this was 1908, on June the 30th. And it exploded and great devastation of the forest around for 70 kilometers. And this was... Uh, an explosion estimated to be at 8.6 kilometers through. Yeah, both of these from Russia, and these were actually captured on film at the time or in paintings. And this is the uh, Bergalaska on the left and the Sikota Elin. I do have some specimens of the material that came through Sikota Elin. It was a Nikolai meteorite. The $64,000 question, of course, is where are they and how many are there? This is a schematic on the right showing the distribution of asteroids in the asteroid belt and then of three of the other nodes that occur with it. And the important ones for us, of course, are those that have near Earth cutting orbits and those that are potentially hazardous. That means that they are just beyond the uh, almost double the moon's distance away from us. The following plot is one I believe was the last that Eugene Shoemaker did before his untimely death in a car accident in Australia. And this is a plot of the near Earth or the Earth crossing orbits of uh, asteroids out there on top of the orbits of the inner planets. Earth is the second from the left and note the incidence of crossing orbits with the Earth's orbits. It just means that the potential for an impact is, is real. Two photographs here, just to illustrate the size of what may be up there and floating around. The one on geographic, geographics on the left, and this is around two kilometers uh, uh, in length. And the one on the right is Gaspar, and this is the 10 to 20 kilometer. Huge materials, lots of mass, traveling fast, huge amounts of energy. Approximately 38 to 39,000 samples have been collected from non falls. Two thirds of these come from Antarctica, and most of the rest come from the dry deserts. It is, un <coughs> it is interesting to see that 
two programs in Antarctica, one by a Japanese, another one from the U.S., led by one of our former students, Bill Cassidy, have been very, very successful finds. The size of these are mostly less than the size of a football and fist size, but there are a couple of outliers, and we'll take a look at some of these shortly. There is no known record of anybody being killed by a meteorite, and if there had been a very large one, there'd have been nobody to survive to record it. There have been two known <coughs> cases of meteorites. One landed in a woman's lap, and the other one was into the back end of a car. I was fortunate enough to see the one at State College in October 1992 at a football game at the junior high school. And <laughs> I was able to jump up immediately, make a mark on the fence, stand where I was and get an idea of the angle at which it had come over. And my <laughs> expectations were that it had landed in Kish Valley. We went over there, we didn't find anything at all. The image on the left here is the fireballs that streaked over Altoona. It's very similar to what we had seen at State College. And on the right is where a football-sized chunk landed in the back of this old Chevy Malibu. It was reputed that the car's value was enhanced more than double by the fact that it got actually struck by a meteorite. The reason why Antarctic ice seems to be such a prominent spot for collecting meteorites is illustrated on the left, where meteorites falling into the ice sheet get concentrated as the ice moves over and ablates away at the toe. The real instigators between these are Japanese scientists and also one of our own was Bill Cassidy from the University of Pittsburgh now. On the right is one of the unusual <coughs> meteorites that fell in Antarctica in the Allen Hills, and it was one that was determined to be part of a, me a Martian meteorite. The following two show two of the larger meteorites that have remained intact coming through the atmosphere. First is 14 tons that came through from Greenland, and the one on the right is variously estimated between 60 and 85 tons, and it is still in the ground in a site in Namibia. It is called the Hobus. Not unexpectedly, the meteorites contain some exotic minerals, minerals that are not normally found on Earth, and we call these extragalactic. A few of them are mentioned in here. Of course, one of the important ones we find on, on diamonds. To me, one of the most interesting things that seem to be associated with meteorites making it through the atmosphere is a type of glass, blobs of material that is as if they'd been poured onto the desert floor. And it means that there's some very exotic and unknown form of energy transfer that isn't necessarily solid, but has the capability of melting the material in place probably similar to the fulgurites that are associated with lightning strikes. The next step up associated with meteorite falls is if they are sufficiently large and barrel their way through the atmosphere, they probably blast their way through, they should leave some scar on the ground. We talk about these imprints of these scars or the footprints of these scars as astrobleams. And we'll walk through some of these in the next few slides, which will progress from relatively fresh rimmed pit type craters, which would you expect it, to those that may be degraded and those that are partly buried and then exhumed. Our classic model of an impact crater, of course, is Meteor Crater in Arizona, shown here in two views, one in aerial photograph from the left and another from the rim on a field trip that I was fortunate enough to be there. Gene Shoemaker in the fall <coughs> ground leading the lecture and a group of would-be astronauts listening to what he had to say. We're still dealing with the simple pit craters. The one on the left is Wolf Creek, Australia, about a kilometer across. In a desert environment, there's a little bit of salt water, salt pan in the center. And surprisingly, the one on the right is also a desert environment, but this time the Canadian Arctic. And this is the New Quebec crater, also the Chubb crater, the one that's sparked my interest in the whole thing. I've camped on this lake, and uh, the hill in the far background there, from 
water level to the top is more than 600 feet. We plumbed the center of the crater at about 1300 feet deep and some of the clearest water in the world. The disc that you use is a 14 inch disc and that is still visible at 126 feet. The water is increasing remarkably cold. I, I fell in there while loading the uh, float plane that was dealing with us and I can attest to that. We did bring out a fish from here. I've never seen anything like it. And we uh, pickled it in a, in a paint can and brought it back. And it turned out to be a malnutrition char that must have come in on duck's feet. Take a look next at some of the partly degraded ones. Tenorea in Mauritania, about 1.8 kilometers. And Aloil in Mauritania, around a, <coughs> a third of a kilometer across. These are partly filled with desert sand. The next two slides would indicate that these are buried craters. Both of them have Ordovician sediments over the top of them, some up to about 600 feet thick. The circular structures are apparent in both. The one on the left is Brent in Ontario, and the one on the right in Holliford. Holliford was interesting because that was the first known scientific drilling done in the Western world. Three drill holes are put down, indicate <coughs> that there was a breccia underneath, and uh, a gas came up with these. The drillers, of course, had all been used to drilling on the Canadian Shield and didn't know what the gas was, and one lit a match and burnt down the drill shack. Now, all the previous ones were the types of circular patterns that we could see on normal aerial photographs. In Quebec, there was a two that we always thought was a tandem pair called the Clearwater Lakes, east and west, and a very peculiar thing was apparent here. The one on the left, bigger than the one on the right, had islands in an annular pattern within the center and an uplifted center. The one on the right was still a degraded or subdued rimmed pit. It's a case of maybe there is a really important story in here. I attribute most of the deductions for determining the difference between the simple pit and one with islands and that in the center and uplift to Michael Denson and Dave Roddy. And this is part of their cartoons of what actually had happened. They had rationalized that in the simple pit, the distance to a reflector to get a return wave intention was sufficiently far away not to affect the morphology of the pit. The one on the right is that the event is sufficiently large that you could have a major reflection coming off a discontinuity such as the moho and lifting it up. This would be analogous to dropping a golf ball into water and watching the inverted teardrop that came up in the center and led to the whole concept of central uplifts. We were fortunate to have some cratering experiments in operation at the time. One was the nuclear blast at Sudan in the Nevada desert and the other was 550 ton ordnance blast where Canadians were getting rid of World War II explosives. And this is at Prairie Flats Suffield Test Site in Alberta. Nasty control conditions of glacial till over the top of Precambrian ice with not too big a distance in between. Take a look at the blast on the right. That's the TNT blast going off, and the one underneath it is what happened afterwards. Notice there's rims in that within it, annuluses of ridges and valleys, and much of the material had come up in the center. Gave a justification that the model for central uplift was correct. Now that the theory for a central uplift was better known, it was <coughs> proved us to go back and examine some of these very peculiar structures, which were called crypto explosion structure, crypto volcanic <coughs> structures that occurred in relatively normal rocks and then had a jumbled procession of materials in the center with great uplifts. Some of these, more than 5,000 feet of rock had been brought up from depth into the central part of the uplift, which was sort of underformed and unconstrained on the margins. And the one I'd like to focus on here is the one called Kentland. Kentland is now known as a quarried area where they're taking out material there for aggregate. And this is in glaciated terrain in Indiana, not too far to the west of us. And uh, the amazing thing here is that those rocks you see opened in there 
Some of those have come up close to a mile from their normal positions. Drill holes on either side would show the normal position and the knees are in the center. And we have to thank our very forward-looking geologist from Notre Dame, by Ray Murray Gutschek, who was the mentor of Barry Voigt. And Ray had looked at these in great deal and then found peculiar fractures in these. Top right is shatter cones. And the one underneath there is highly fractured rock that is in the central portion that doesn't occur outside of these. These gave us some idea of some of the mechanisms then for the central uplift of the uh, from an impact. The hut was now on to take a look at very peculiar structures such as the one below. This is Goss's Bluff, Australia. And you have to appreciate we're looking at some getting on for the central portion there, they're more than five kilometers across, and the main portion of the basin at least 22 kilometers out. And in these, we found disturbed rocks with shatter cones. Other features now in the 30 to 100 kilometers across were apparent once the Earth satellites, Landsat and others, had gone up, because now you're imaging a portion of the Earth that is something like 160 kilometers across. The one on the left is Manicouagan in Quebec, and these were troughs around, and that's what you're looking at is an annulus valley with a central uplift. Most of what you see there through the cloud covered, that's the white pock marks, is vegetation. It's Mount Barber, and it stands at some of the highest elevations around. Another one of these is in Papagai, Siberia, and that is the circular structure. It's about the size of a pea, and the central portion upper and uh, the total length size of this is estimated around 100 kilometers the interesting thing about Papagai are the number of micro diamonds that occur in the area and these are thought to have been related to shock into some carbonate rocks the search is now on worldwide for these using satellite imagery as your base and this is one of Sierra de Kangali in Brazil the central peak there about 12 kilometers across and the total impact probably getting up around 80 or 90 kilometers. Not too far to the north of us is the Sadbury Basin, the center of the copper nickel industry in Canada, with 23 miles in a basin shown in red in the diagram underneath, which is around 25 miles across. It has obviously been squished, the northern end underformed, a southern end has been folded back onto the main portion at the top. This uh, is an interesting structure, and if you take a look at the uh, figure on the right, you'll see what it looks like in a uh, Landsat image. The <coughs> peculiar type of lake on the right of it is Lake Wanapate, which we also believe is a, an impact structure. There's an interesting story behind Sudbury because involving Penn State. A man by the name of Robert Dietz had proposed that the copper and nickel at Sudbury had come from a meteorite. And he was giving a lecture at Penn State the same day that the president of International Nickel Corporation from Sudbury was there to promote or to have Penn State design some special rock balls for him. He listened to the lecture and, and <clears throat> said he had underwritten a field trip to Sudbury for anybody to come and have a look, more close look at this. I drove up with people from the Dominion Observatory and we parked at Copper Cliff down on the southern side over here and got there late at night and parked in the parking lot and in the bank in the parking lot, we found shatter cones. The next diagram is a summary of the various circular structures that we believe are astrobeams from the Canadian Shield. And notice the one on the top left is Sudbury, Manicouag, and we've already taken a look at. I've looked at a number of these others. On the right is a summary of them, of what their shape looked like, the morphology. And then we note that there is a change in morphology with size. The bigger up we go there, the morphology changes. So clearly the rim pit and only circular structure took us up to the next level, but not necessarily to the top. And the next level up is, where are the moire-sized craters 
that we see on the moon. Two images of the moon, the forward side on the left and the back side on the right. That's Mori Oriental on the far side. They're looking at something now that's getting on to a thousand kilometers across. And if we had to try and extrapolate this back to the Earth, this is getting onto the same size as many of our small cratons or small continents, and in the same scale as the types of events that take place in plate tectonics. So having them preserved is going to be a real challenge. We are <clears throat> indebted to Greeley, who proposed a model for one of these to indicate that if we had a thing uh, bolide the size of one that is proposed for Barberton, that's 37 kilometers across, it would have punched a hole right through the crust and into the mantle, causing upwelling of mantle material as lava, such as in the, we believe the Runa Ore, and into fractured rock at the surface. The model that you see in here is due to Greeley, 1984, and it gives us at least some idea of what we might be looking at. An obvious site is Chicxulub, Yucatan, and this is an event that is <coughs> uh, purported to be the dinosaur killing event at the end of the Cretaceous. The diagram on the right is the artist's impression of what it might look like. The diagram on the left shows the gravity anomaly that remi remains today. And this may well be the signature that we have to look for as unusual gravity and magnetic patterns in the rock rather than for a morphological uh, type of, of uh, crater. It is all a matter of scale involving mass, velocity, and time. The time factor we talk is brisance, and this is the rate at which energy is transferred. We're looking at phenomena here that are only beyond human experience. And what we need to do is see if we can calibrate these in terms of the magnitude of large natural features that we're more familiar with, such as tsunami, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. So what we're looking at next is natural phenomena calibrated with man-made explosions on which we have a much better tie-in and idea of the uh, magnitude of the events. And these are then going to be with respect to TNT and atom bombs and nuclear bombs. I'll go back to the Achilles predictions from 1972 now and updated them in certain ways. Anything in red here is part of the update, but the rest comes through from, from uh, the work of the Achilles. On the left is the size of the bolide. In the middle is the energy equivalent in terms of uh, in ergs, and then on the right, in the more modern terminology, in terms of joules. And what I've indicated here, that if we ended up with something that's trying to get up to the 10 to the 26 joule state, we're dealing with an event that can cause at least 100 meters of water all in the oceans to boil away. We put on the same here, some <coughs> cosmic sort of comparisons there, rotation energy of the moon, rotation energy of the Earth, moon around the Earth and Earth around the sun. Just to give you some idea that if we end up with an impact that starts matching these, these are going to be the net effects. The worst of these is if we ended up with something sufficiently large, such as the Earth around the sun, it's a 10 to the 33 joules and greater, it could knock us right outside of our solar system. The following is a revised scale of energetic events, building on what Dekili had. Anything in black would be from Frank Dekili, and anything in red has been added to, mainly from data gleaned from Wikipedia and other sources. Please appreciate that these are all estimates of what the energy is going to be. Very, very difficult to tie down exactly what the energy is going to be. But with this, you'll notice that we have man-made events in there, and the one I'd like to focus on is the bottom of the left-hand page, called Tsar Bomba. Stalin had an idea that he wanted everything bigger and better than anything that was done in the West, and he had ordered his scientists to produce a 100 megaton bomb. One of the few and rare times that the physicists and that <coughs> revolted against him, they try to point out to him that 100 megaton, you could end up crossing the threshold and causing nitrogen 
to literally go into a chain reaction, which meant we to become a supernova. And they compromised to a 50 megaton bomb, but it's the largest man-made explosion. But if you take a look in terms of some of the other natural events that had taken place, Krakatawa, Tunguska, or Sixalab, then you'd realize that they, they were very much greater than anything that man has been able to do so far. Thank God. Well, this comes down with progress to scale and realized that morphology has changed with scale. What is the next? Are we dealing with features that are going to be in the size of a small continent or in the size of a craton? And with plate tectonics, it's going to be highly modified. And so it's going to be unusual textures and unusual components, components such as incorporating whatever the asteroid material is into Earth material. And I speculate here yeah, that some of the very unusual commodities that occur in the greenstone belts may be relics of an earlier bombardment. What we normally would end up doing is find some unusual composition or state. And I believe Hiroshimoto has actually found this from the site in Australia. And I also believe that there may be unusual quench textures that are associated with these rings. And I speculate that some of the spinifex textures in the commodities and that may well be a manifestation of the next scale up. Well, it isn't all doom and gloom. Over on the left here, I'll give you some of the consequential damage that could happen from a large impact or large asteroid impacting the Earth. Tidal waves, windstorms, earthquakes, wildfires, potential energy, oxygen loss to the atmosphere, particularly if it's a nickel iron you'd end up sucking all the oxygen out of the atmosphere. The debris that will last probably decades and so on to be equivalent to the nuclear winter, and uh, most of the vegetation would die. An overheated atmosphere would be one of the biggest problems. We'd be talking about 12 or 1300 degrees, and appreciate that for 20 minutes at about 140 degrees, we end up with lung searing temperatures. So very few animals that would have respiratory systems such as ours would actually uh, survive. Climate change, ocean boiling event would be one of the major effects of one of these as well, especially if we boiled off 100 meters or 200 meters of the dirt, would, would destroy most of the marine life in the process. And maybe the, new, <clears throat> the mass extinctions we've seen in the past all manifestations of some impact such as these. The last thing we'd like to see happen is something large enough there to change the orbital characteristics of the Earth as we know it right now.